Okay, welcome back to my channel, Unsolved No More. Today, I want to speak briefly about this John Bonet confession uh, that's going around making the media circus. It seems like this happens every uh, couple of years. Uh, John Mark Carr was one, and now this guy, what's his name, Vale or Olivia, something like that, and his friend is is Vale. Um, just let me, Gary Olivia. What I want to do is show you how things get twisted or how things are made to fit a narrative. You hear me talk about that a lot. Uh, it seems like, have you ever heard of a cold case, famous cold case where someone just arbitrarily confesses and is arrested based upon that confession. No, you don't. Now, think of a famous cool case where you have heard people alleged to have confessed to friends. How many? Almost every one of them, right? But no arrests come out of it. So, what I want to do is go through this article a little bit that I want to read and certain pieces of it I want to bring to your attention and ask you if you see anything wrong with it or anything at all like that I see. So a suspect in the unsolved killing of John Benet Ramsey had ties to a property just 13 houses away from the family home at the time of a murder and was spotted at a cat candlelight vigil for a girl carrying a sealed envelope now based off that headline i'm intrigued are you not Ooh, okay let's keep reading gary olivia a convicted pedophile who is currently in prison was for years considered a suspect in the murder of six-year john benet who was found being beaten and strangled December 26, 1996. And they have a picture, picture here of a very um, pedophile-ish looking Gary Olivia. The 59-year-old has previously admitted to having an obsession with the slain child, beauty pageant queen, and has authored a series of confession letters from prison claiming to have killed John Bonet by accident. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. He's in prison. He's writing letters confessing to a high-profile case. What does that remind you of, if anything? Right off the bat, I'll tell you what it reminds me of. It reminds me of Glenn Rogers, who was a mean SOB, and I... And he is a murderer, without a doubt. But he started dropping hints while in prison that he killed Nicole Brown Simpson, right? And the media latched onto that. Uh, even a guy that I know, who I have zero respect for, I did at one time, but he had correspondence with Glenn Rogers in prison, and he started believing that, and he had sent me some stuff on it. Because he was dropping hints about earrings and, and blah, blah, blah. All that is is noise. Okay? That's all that is. You need to separate that from the evidence and the facts of the case. I could get arrested in prison and be in there with time on my hands and think, how can I mess with the police? How can I get my name back in the paper? Well, you know what I'll do? I'll draw a picture of... Nicole Brown Simpson and OJ Simpson, and I put an earring in there. Oh my God, she was missing an earring. So it had to be him, right? He, who else would know that she was missing an earring? It's things like that, that people want to jump on instead of looking at facts. 
because of that earring and because of him dropping that mystery clue that only he knows about, it takes away, right? It takes away the blood evidence. It takes away the domestic violence. It, it takes away the cut. It takes away the DNA. All those things. Now we're just going to forget about them. Let's continue, shall we? Olivia has never been charged in this case. Well, we know that, right? His DNA was tested in the early 2000s, but it's believed he was not found to be a match. Well, no joke. You're kidding me. Okay. John Ramsey is going around saying, hey, whoever murdered my little girl, their DNA, touch DNA, we have a profile, whether it's full, whether it's partial, whatever it is, but we have it. It's not blood, not semen. I touch DNA. Correct me if I'm wrong. If it's blood and semen, I'll change my whole my whole train of thought on John Bonet Ramsey case. But right now, it's touch DNA. They just said they tested this guy, and it's not a match. So why are we worrying about his confession if everyone believes that that DNA belongs to the killer? Oh, it's just not this guy. I got you. All right, let's continue. Now, one of his former high school classmates, Michael Vale, is urging Boulder PD investigators to take a second look at Olivia and what he deems to be the stark circumstantial evidence tying him to the crime. At the time of John Bonet's murder, Olivia was homeless and sleeping on the streets of Boulder. He was known to frequent the University of Colorado campus and also often hung in and around the St. Thomas Aquinas Catholic, Catholic Center where he would collect his mail and hang out with other vagrants in the parking lot. Okay, typical homeless guy right now, right? I don't see anything connecting him. Let's just keep reading. Oh, but the university campus is less than a mile from the Ramsey home. While St. Thomas Aquinas is mere 13 houses away. Remember when he said they had, he had, at the beginning of this, he had ties to a house. He lived at a property 13 houses away from the Ramseys. Oh, now that we are invested because of the headline, we're going to read further and find out Oh, it's actually, he used to hang around St. Thomas, which is 13 houses away. See how they just manipulated you? And me? Okay, he didn't have ties to a property. That's not a tie to a property. Okay, that's a homeless guy hanging out in a parking lot. But let's, let's keep going and see if we see anything else. A long alleyway running behind the church also extends to the Ramsey home, meaning someone can move between the two properly, properties easily and potentially undetected. Oh my goodness. See, this reminds me of the Eddie Edwards case, where you start trying to make things fit a narrative that doesn't. Now some people ask me, or they'll send me, emails they actually take time out of their day to send me an email and they'll say stuff like why do you yell why do you scream raise your voice well let me tell you why you ever watch a football game or go to a football game hockey baseball and you're invested and you cheer every time there's a hit or there's a goal or someone scores a touchdown gets an interception a fourth and goal line stop you're excited, right? You're passionate about your team. I'm the same way about cold cases. I'm passionate about them. Don't ask me why. I don't know why. You know, I, I can't say why Rocky Marciano was passionate about training, but he did it better than any other boxer alive. And the fruits of that labor was a 49-0 and record with 43 knockouts. You see what I'm getting at? So if I get loud, or if I get animated or passionate, that's the reason. I care about the facts and not speculation to fit a narrative. So now they, they want to 
And let me read this again, because it's just, whoever wrote this article has an agenda. He's biased already. That's why I say it's so important when you look at a cold case to go in unbiased. So I'll get victim family members, okay, to, to give me a case or send me a case. And they'll start in with, well, so-and-so was arrested because, or is a suspect. He lived six houses down and everyone in town knew him as a bully. And he wants, stop, stop, time. I don't want to hear it, okay? Because you're, you're biased right now by, by telling me that. I can already see. And police reports can get biased too. I don't want to be biased. If I read that subconsciously and I and I know better but my brain doesn't care it says ooh anytime anything's going to fit that guy while you're reading the report and narratives you're going to be biased and you're going to be slanted towards him you don't want to do that you want to go in in an unbiased approach i don't want to know anything just give me the police reports you know give me the autopsy report those are what, I, I don't want to hear anything else. After I've done my assessment and I've looked everything at an unbiased way, now let's sit down and you tell me it all. Then I'll, I'll take it all, all the rumors, all the innuendos, all those things. But until then, I don't want it because it makes you biased. So I want to reread this paragraph. A long alleyway running behind the church, remember where he is a vagrant and hangs out, but they're saying he's tied to this property, also extends to the Ramsey home, meaning someone could move between the two properly, properties easily and potentially undetectable. No shit. That means nothing. So what? Someone could drive down the street at three in the morning and there's nobody else on the street. So if I was writing this article, I could say, well, the offender stole a car and drove down and parked right in front of the Ramsey home because no one would be able to see he was there because at three o'clock in the morning, that area is completely isolated and desolate. Therefore, it could be easily and potentially undetected. See what I mean? Okay. John Bonet's bedroom window would have also been visible from the alley. So what? Any house that's on a road has a bedroom window more than likely visible somehow from some angle from the road. She and her older brother Burke were known to ride their bicycles down the concealed pathway too. I'm going to stop right there. So freaking what? What kind of evidence is that? They're saying that this is circumstantial evidence. No, it's not. That's evidence that could fit 300,000 people. Okay, I'm exaggerating there a little bit. But I bet you in that town of Boulder, Colorado, I bet you that that could fit probably 500 people right off the bat. Anybody that walked that alley, anybody that drove on that road could see John Bonet Ramsey's window. And they are slanting it towards this pedophile. Now, I'm not saying whether he's innocent or guilty. I mean, I I don't know that. I'm But I'm saying that when the newspapers write their articles, they are certainly, at least this one, slanting it to make everyone believe that this guy could be responsible. Now think about the other confessions, at least one that we had in this, where a district attorney bought it. Guy was arrested on child pornography uh, charges, right? And he's the killer. Press conference and everything. <laughs> he's not. No, no evidence whatsoever. You can't be in a rush to solve a cold case. They're cold for a reason. Sometimes it's because 
in that police work, sure. But not this. Okay? They made mistakes in the beginning. They didn't know what they had. And at the end of this, I'm going to link my other John Bonet video, the very encompassing one that I did at the beginning of this channel. And, uh, and I go through all the scenarios, every single one of them pretty much. And it shows me that the evidence to me points to something happening inside the home from somebody inside that home. No, not 100%, you know. I love these people that that are just like 1,000%. It was an, it was an intruder. And, I, you know, you can't change their mind. And then they'll send me like a 16-page uh, dissertation about why. Now, if I wanted to, you could certainly sit there and pick everything apart. Any side can do that. I am open to an intruder. I think a good investigator has to be open to other theories if evidence backs them up. Now, if you gave me just this pedophile with him hanging out as a vagrant uh, on a church parking lot 13 houses away, being able to see John Bonet's window, and because John Bonet and Burke rode their bikes in the alleyway, that he's a suspect, I'm going to say you're full of it. But now, if you were to tell me, hey, uh, a week earlier, he was stopped by police leaving the Ramsey residence uh, after talking to John Bonet uh, drinking lemonade. Well, then I would say, okay, now I'm a little bit more intrigued, but we don't have none of that, okay? We have a pedophile, which to me, I would have to look at his record, but I'm guessing you have to look at proclivity. And if he has a proclivity to younger kids and he has ties to that area, yes, yes, obviously you want to look at him. And according to this article, he was a suspect at one point in time. Well, if he's not a suspect anymore, his DNA ruled out, right? I mean, if that's what we're, we're saying, that DNA is the killers, which I don't really, I don't believe that. Uh, but he's ruled out. The police looked at him and he's ruled out. Now, why? You got to ask yourself this. Moments after John Bonet is killed, this guy just is going to call his high school friend and say, I heard a little girl. Think about that. Just think about that statement alone. How asinine is that? You're going to believe that? But why would he do that? Hours afterwards, guilt's kicked in already. He's already murdered. And the first thing he's going to do is call somebody and say, I heard a little girl, and then when he inquires more, hey, tell me what you're talking about, he hangs up on him. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't make sense. Absolutely not. I just, I get upset with the media. I know they have a job to do, but isn't it about... You know, I don't know. You would think it's just about facts. I don't know. I, I Can you look at that article and say, yeah, I guess they're facts, right? Everything that they said was probably factual. But it's spun in a certain way to make you feel a certain way. You know, that John Bonet's killer is still out there and it's this guy. Well, is this guy's name not getting ruined because of that? Now, granted, he's a pedophile, and I, I don't have the time of a day for a pedophile. They're the lowest scum on earth, I feel. Yet, I do not like to accuse anybody without evidence. And I mean 99.9% .9 evidence to publicly accuse somebody. Even a pedophile piece of crap, I wouldn't do that to. 
You know, why? Just think of your name. Let's pretend you're not a pedophile, and I'm hoping 99.9% .9 of you that are watching my channel are not. And somebody says to you, let's say you're, a, you're an electrician, you're a drywaller, whatever it is. And somebody connects you to the John Bonet Ramsey case because what? You lived in Boulder, you were going to college during that time, and you got drunk in a disorderly charge one block from the Ramsey home the night before she got murdered. So therefore, you did blacked out and you committed this act. So people at your job start telling you and telling people, hey, I'm working with a guy who killed John Bonet Ramsey. How would that make you feel? Then it gets back to the boss. And the boss fires you. I can't have you around here. Yeah, I know you didn't do it. I know. All it takes is the allegation. And then the word spread. Rumors go. Then you go to try to get another job, and you can't. So then you start thinking, well, you know what? I can do drywall. I can do electricity. I can do all that. I'll start my own business. And you get everything set up, and guess what? Now you can't get clients. Because word is spread around Boulder that you hurt John Bonet Ramsey. So now you got to move out of Boulder, move out of Colorado. See the, the ripple effect here? All because somebody wanted to accuse somebody without evidence. The, late, the last book I wrote, and probably the last book that I will ever write, uh, I was very careful in not to put last names in the book. It's very hard to write a nonfiction true crime book without naming names, right? Unless you, know, you change them, and that's what I did to protect the innocent, even if they were suspects, even if I thought they were responsible. I'm not putting it out there because they've never been convicted by a jury of their peers. They have never been arrested. And I don't know 100% whether they did it. 99.8 is not good enough for me. So I guess the bottom line is, do I feel that there's merit to this? No. Not saying that he didn't do it. I'm just saying I don't believe the confession that he called his buddy. And then, you know, the, the letter writing from prison, I, I can get that. I can get behind that. I've seen that happen before. It doesn't mean it's the truth. Him calling this guy hours after John Bonet's murder, uh, I, don't, I don't buy it. Produce a phone record, show me something, you know, it doesn't make sense. And if it doesn't make sense to me, I don't believe it. The guy's not going to call you and say, I heard a little girl and then hang up. Makes no sense. Makes zero sense. And that's how you have to think. Don't go down that rabbit hole. If it doesn't make sense, move it to the side. If you have to, come back to it later once you've reached a dead end going down the route of truth and factual evidence, whether it's circumstantial, whether it's direct, it doesn't matter. But as long as the evidence is having you follow those leads until that stops, until you hit that brick wall there and you're like, where do I go now? All right, let's go back to this potentially bullshit claim. But you know what? Now I'm going to follow that out until I hit a dead end. That's how you got to do it, folks. Okay? You're going to have confessions in this John Benet Ramsey case. And I'm here to tell you 99.9% .9 of them are false. Okay? You ask yourself, why? Why do, why do people do this? They do it. Criminals don't think like you and I do. Okay? Some people want the attention. You know, that's just the way they are. So, I don't think anyone will ever confess to this murder. Again, the evidence to me, that ransom note, the handwriting of that ransom note, the verbiage, the language of that ransom note. The movements inside that house. The things done, the things that should have been done, that were not done. 
all point me. Just my personal opinion that the person responsible for John Bonet's death was somebody inside that house on that night. Meaning, not meaning an intruder came into that house. I mean a family member, somebody staying there. That is what it comes down to. Somebody that was very, very comfortable and familiar with that house. And statistics. <laughs> you know, you throw statistics in there. You know, ransom note length, kidnap somebody and they don't get kidnapped. Things like that. I, that's what I see. If you are relying on DNA, I'm here to tell you, please research how to touch DNA, how easily manufacturers of underwear, their DNA can be tracked all the way to the person wearing that, that undergarment. You can't rely on touch DNA. I'm sorry. I, you know, if you have skin cells of some sort, you know, from friction, from, yes, I'll buy it. But in this case, in a murder that happened, what, 1995, 1996, whenever it was, uh, when DNA was still kind of at its infancy, if you're going to tell me you're relying on touch DNA to tell me an intruder did it, I don't believe it. Now, if you were to come at me and say, hey, we have semen. Okay. Now, now I'm interested. If you tell me it's blood and it's not John Bonet's, now I'm interested. DNA doesn't solve every crime. Okay. Determination, passion, and a little bit of luck. That's what solves uh, most of these crimes. DNA helps sometimes if it's semen. If it's skin cells found maybe under fingernails, um, depending on how they were murdered. Blood, that DNA, I'll take that. Touch DNA, too shaky for me. Well, but let me qualify that answer by saying if touch DNA is a hit, if it's a match to, let's say, a pedophile that lived in Boulder and he never worked at a clothing manufacturer. His DNA, his touch DNA has absolutely no reason to ever be on there. Okay. Well then, yeah, I'm going. But if you have touch DNA and you can't put it to anybody and you've tested thousands and thousands of people, well then maybe it's because it's, it's innocent DNA. And there is innocent transfer DNA out there. One of my cases got ruined at the lab. Pennsylvania State Police Crime Lab. Murder case that I had. By transfer DNA. So I've I seen it happen. Alright, my thoughts on John Bonet Ramsey and this confession. Don't believe it. You'll get another one in a, another year or so. I'm going to link my video at the end here. If you haven't watched it, click on it. If you have watched it, it doesn't hurt to watch it again, does it? Look at the evidence. You'll see. Okay. Hey, thanks for watching. Mains out.